in this call and we are starting the third day of our seminar restoration of the document restoration of the document conservatism and innovation I'm also very glad to welcome those who watch us on the video so on the first day we had almost 900 online visitors we are going to start this session with uh, representing our colleagues uh, from the Library for Foreign Literature from the Center of uh, Conservation and Restoration. They are going to speak about IFLA Preservation and Conservation Program implementation in Russia. The paper will be presented by Mr. Belyakov, not the one who is on the program. Oh. I am uh, Rosa Salnikova. I only wanted to say uh, the word of welcome to you. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here and participate. My words of thanks go to the general director of the library, Mr. Valery Duda, to uh, Alexei Kashev, to Olga Solomatina for the perfect organization for this most, uh, for this warmest welcome. Uh, my thanks uh, to the uh, master classes, lecturers, uh, and uh, we learned a lot of new and useful things from them. So thanks a lot for to everybody. So I wish you a very successful day. And now give the floor to our young specialist, Peter Belyakov. It was Rosa Salnikova who is head of the Center of Conservation and Restoration of Documents of the Library for Foreign Literature. So, thanks again, dear colleagues. As you know well, there is such an organization which is... Uh, oh, is, it, is it okay? Do you hear me? Uh, there is such an organization which is called IFLA. This is the abbreviation which stands for the International Federation for Library Associations. This is a non-governmental independent organization. It includes library associations, librarians, and information services, library and library information organizations. It was founded in Edinburgh, in Scotland, in 1927 by the participants to the International Conference of the Directors of National Libraries. And uh, uh, since this time, it's now a global voice of the library profession. It includes uh, more than 1,600 members. Specialists from different countries can share experience, inspire each other, and uh, find and resolve mutually met problems. The results of uh, IFLA's activity are reflected in the IFLA journal, a quarterly journal which gives methodological recommendations, reports, and uh, monographs on a wide spectrum of issues. Uh, annually, it conducts congresses collecting specialists throughout the world. Today, IFLA has 50 professional sections. They have sections on certain issues and uh, over 500 participants of professional committees participate in the work of these sections. In our sphere, in the sphere of preservation and conservation of the World Documentary Collection, uh, in 1977, we had this special section, which is an international forum for experience sharing uh, and dissemination of knowledge. IFLA prepares a special issue of the IFLA journal on uh, preservation of documents and storage of documents on different media, both physical and electronic. The section cooperates with the strategic IFLA program called PAC. 
This is the strategic program on conservation and preservation. It was started, it was, was set up in 1984 to attract attention to the problems of conservation of library materials on the international uh, level. Today, IFLAPAC program is being implemented uh, by the representatives of 16 regional <coughs> center. Each center is uh, or has its own features, but they are all combined by a, a uniform goal. In 1919, in 1999, IFLA has adopted a new st strategy where one of the missions of the organization, you see that, well, uh, uh, there was the section on conservation and the strategic conservation program. So the, the, this is a problem of identification. So the people who don't deal in this directly, uh, well, uh, meet uh, some problems in understanding the structure of IFLA because of these two lines of development. So if we speak about our center, the Center in the Library for Foreign Literature, we have the tasks of attracting attention to the problems of conservation, attracting the attention of the governmental offices, publication and uh, uh, translation of the literature on this subject, the attraction of the professional um, audience throughout the world, organization of trainings, workshops, and other forms of cooperation, and development of new conservation methods. Now uh, we would like to speak more about the activity of our center which is uh, in the Library for Foreign Literature. Currently, we are preparing for publication and the translation uh, the following methodological recommendations. Methods of uh, conservation and restoration of books before digitization. They were developed by the Library of Czech Republic and uh, we had a cooperation agreement between the Library of uh, Czech Republic and our library. The book is going to be distributed on a uh, free basis. Uh, such problems were selected not just occasionally, because digitization has been in the limelight of attention for many years already. The digitization of collections is a very important and complex task. Before 2014, uh, IFLA produced the International Preservation Use and distributed it through the IFLA Park centers and the journal informed about new conservation methods, uh, the activity of the centers, different events in conservation, and uh, uh, many other professional issues. But due to some economical reasons, this uh, journal ceased to be produced. But uh, uh, within the people of our professional community, we still uh, remember about it, and we still uh, get new information about the new methodologies. So we decided to make a database with the announcements on this topic, and we are now working on the website and uh, designing the concept of this electronic uh, mass media. We are going to reprint, republish the methodological recommendation of the conservation and restoration of books, which were issued in 1998. Uh, this is a methodological uh, guidance for the specialists in the conservation and restoration field. Uh, the experts of our center are very experienced in training. And we organized a lot of courses, internships, and workshops. These events are held for uh, different people, but also for narrowly specialized people. 
A few words about international cooperation, which we have within the IFLA PAC agreement. Uh, our center and the center for the uh, Arab countries and Middle East uh, had uh, some cooperation. The people visited both centers and uh, exchanged experience. We had friendly and professional relations with the center for the Middle Asia, which is located in the National Library of Kazakhstan. We had several webinars and uh, took part in the webinars which were organized by the center. Among the topics considered was uh, the production of marble paper, the restoration and uh, conservation of the manuscript and printed uh, heritage and production of bindings. Especially interesting was the um, interdisciplinary scientific and practical conference, book monuments in the uh, aspect of conservation. Uh, this year, this conference will be held in December. And we are going to analyze the uh, development uh, uh, of uh, different methodologies in this field and uh, analyze the latest achievements. Coming to the conclusion, I would like to say that the PEC Center is very active in the problems of conservation of uh, book documents, paying special attention to the information and methodological activities. We are in close cooperation with this center, and we would like to invite uh, to our events this year and in the years to come different people, and you may find additional information on the website of our library. If you have any questions which we could uh, answer, we would like to be um, helpful in consultation services. And we are open for cooperation and joint projects. We invite you to cooperate uh, both on our platform, on our premises and other premises uh, for conducting workshops and uh, different trainings. And now uh, a short film about the activity of our center.
So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, you are welcome. <coughs> thank you very much uh, for this, well, substantial presentation. And I hope it was interesting uh, to the audience. It's always very interesting to invite the colleagues that work with restoration of documents. Especially, it's nice to see young people. So we always welcome young specialists that come to join us because it means that we have a, a continuity between generations. So it's great when they can present the results of their work. So I'm really happy to invite my colleague from our department, the Department of Restoration, Olesia Karabanova. So she will tell us about her work and uh, the process of restoration. She also did the study, so she will share the results of her research. Good morning, everyone. My report is going to be about the studies and restoration of the uh, Dunkers map. In 2019, the restoration department received a map from the cartography department. It's, uh, it was uh, Ultra Lectini Domini Dunkers. It uh, dated back to 1695, and this map has an image of the Netherlands and is part of re-edition of the Denkerts Atlas. Denkerts was a family of Dutch engravers and geographers that produced geographic materials that included the series of original atlases. Initially, Justus Denkerts was a publisher. He published uh, books uh, on different print editions in Amsterdam, and his great uncle, Cornelius Dunkers de Rich, was a geodesist who made an atlas with different views of Amsterdam. The, uh, his brother, uh, Dunker Dunkert was uh, an experienced engraver and he produced several maps. So they basically produced their first maps uh, in the mid of 1680s. And they received later privilege to publish their maps and atlases for 15 years. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, the details of their biographical data, and this is a big uh, problem, especially with regard to younger brothers. So they were producing and publishing atlases and maps, cartographic works of uh, this family, was highly respected and was in high demand. And the, their atlases and maps included uh, quite uh, many sheets, so this confirmed uh, a high level of uh, professionalism and uh, also conf basically proved that they were popular. So this map is a printed graphics work. It is an engraving colored by hand and stick on a grayish blue underlying layer with the entire surface. The image is horizontal, enclosed in a linear yellow frame and uh, this map, like the secondary uh, backing, was made of paper cast by hand. This monument came to the restoration department in a ruined state. Both sides uh, of the map and baking substrate were heavily soiled and uh, yellowish, so they had some stains of unknown etiology, some traces of insects, uh, leaks uh, of a yellow-brown color. There was a general deformation of the sheet, numerous creases on the right edge of the baking layer, small breaks and small losses of the base. At the bottom part in the left corner, we can see some traces of rodents. The margins of the map were trimmed unevenly along uh, the frame, 
So we can make a, a assumption that uh, the atlas was probably disassembled at a later time and uh, its sheets were cut off and then stick to the paper that was produced at a later time. We can see here a blue stamp with the inscription Russian State Library on the back of the substrate. We carried out laboratory studies and uh, it uh, gave the following results. pH of the map base is 5, pH of the underlying substrate 4.6, the water absorption of the paper uh, was low and the paint layer was not waterproof. Uh, so we completed a qualitative microchemical analysis uh, of uh, adhesive scraping from the surface and it showed that uh, it was uh, water soluble of a protein nature. We also studied the technique of engraving. We used uh, the microscope uh, with the uh, magnitude of, 20 of 24. And this uh, engraving was uh, created using the print of deep uh, printing. So then they used uh, the um, paint that was removed from the surface and it stayed only in the deeper layers and thus the paint received the dye from those levels. We couldn't find this stamp, uh, the traces of uh, the engraving machine, but in fact it was quite often that the old engravings were cut off and so no uh, stamps could be found. We analyzed the engravings and here on the slide uh, you can see different uh, signs that uh, prove that this was an engraving. So our laboratory research and examination showed that this map was in unsatisfactory condition and required restoration. We de-dusted the monument using a synthetic brush. We used rubber crumbs and cotton swabs in order to remove all the contamination. We used 5% polyvinyl butyrol solution using a very thin brush for two or three times with the drying process and then controlling all the indicators. We disassembled uh, this monument. Uh, we removed the duplication using the scalpel and uh, we uh, did separate work with the underlying layer and the map itself. We washed all the sheets that uh, uh, we worked with, so we used um, uh, the brush in order to remove the sheets uh, from the glue residues and then rinsed it. And the tone uh, lightened stains and uh, all the uh, leaks became weaker. We used uh, carbon uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide solution and uh, also we carried out chemical treatment until the color of the spots weakened. In order to fill in the losses of the substrate, we selected restoration paper that was close to the original one in color, composition and fiber lengths. We connected the bricks according to the parts and fiber and strengthened them on the reverse side with strips of tea paper. Then uh, we duplicated uh, the sheets using the Japanese paper and then uh, put uh, the ma map uh, back to the substrate and uh, we used uh, uh, flour paste uh, of 5% to strengthen the gaps and fill in losses. 
then uh, this work was placed into the press between the clothes and after 24 hours the cloth was replaced uh, with dry cloth. The map was then uh, kept in the press for two weeks until uh, the glue was completely stabilized and then the excess restoration paper was cut off. So as a result uh, of our restoration activities, we maintain the integrity of the monument uh, and this uh, map can uh, be used both uh, in exhibitions and uh, for research. So thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olesia. If you have any questions, you can ask them or you can ask them face to face later on. So thank you. Of course, it's really nice to see colleagues that come to our events from different organizations, also specialists in restoration, and it's great that we have this collaboration. It's great to have them because uh, they have attended our seminars uh, continuously and I would like to introduce Anna Muratova who is a restoration artist and she uh, works at the Museum of Moscow. So she's going to give a presentation about the restoration of manuscript book. Good afternoon everybody. I am going to speak about the restoration of the manuscript. But before that, I would like to say a few words about the history. The history of... So the book is just a collection of different cases. Okay, okay, now it's the start. The signatures and parts of the book were collected at different time periods. The book paper is different by color, thickness and the authors. The paper is textile. This is when the textile paper was very widely used because the censorship was weakened and private publishing houses appeared. As a result, more paper started to be produced. The production of the textile paper started in the 16th century in Russia. The main processes uh, were like this. The uh, paper was, uh, uh, well, rinsed and at the same time spilled into very, very small pieces. When the water uh, ran, ran away, the paper was put on textile basis, put under press, and uh, which just uh, let the remaining water leave. And after the press, the paper was dried and went to the packing office. When uh, the um, paper pulp uh, was used together with the networks, and uh, the uh, networks were of different mesh, and so this network, either fine or larger, was printed on the paper from the end of the 13th century there were filigree papers that appeared and allowed to um, communicate to the user the year and the quality of this production. This is an example of such a mesh. The first papers appeared and it were connected with a lot of legends. One monk unfortunately dropped a cross 
into the tray, and uh, it was impossible to uh, uh, erase the uh, image of the cross from the paper. This was the sign of God. Uh, in Russia, other signs were used. These were the emblems of the governor, of the area, and uh, also some specificities uh, of the production. The book I am going to describe, this is the description of inhabited and uninhabited lands of Moscow. We see here different signs of these sheets. It means uh, that the paper that was used in the book was produced by different people. I found more than oh, 20 types of filigrees in it. If we speak about the geography of the printed houses uh, that produce paper for this book, mostly these were the producers from the central Russia, but also Moscow and St. Petersburg. These were certified paper producing manufacturers. Now a little bit more about filigrees. There is a monogram and if you see A, uh, M there and then the bear and it was in Yaroslav and this is the emblem of the city of Yaroslav. Uh, this filigree is the monogram NL in the circle. B this belonged to the factory of Mrs. Livintsova. This filigree shows the unicorn with the initials E and B. This was the emblem of the family of Batashovs. Most probably, this unicorn was transferred as a filigree to the factory paper. And here we see the uh, trademark and the <coughs> emblem of the Batashov's family. The filigree shown here INS under the crown and the words Propatria. Uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, this was an allegoric scene, Propatria, for the motherland. It's a rather complicated composition of the Athene goddess depicted behind the fence, you see it here, and, uh, and uh, to the left of her there is the Dutch emblem. Before the 19th century there was a paper of different origin, French, Polish, Italian, German, and then Dutch. The, uh, the the later became the, the latter became very popular in Russia up to the beginning of the 19th century. Oh, oh, the Dutch watermark was still printed even on the Russian paper. This watermark was used by a very famous uh, factory owner. Mr. Shepuchkin. This monogram, ANSH under the crown, is the monogram of Mr. Hlustin, the owner of the factory. These two factories were in the town of Kontrov, and the name of the river is Shania. It's not far from the town of Kaluga. In 1785, the Count Kozlovsky started uh, building a factory uh, on the river of Shania, and uh, this uh, factory owner, who appeared later, started well making, uh, renovating the factory and producing paper. In the middle 19th century, this factory was bought by Mr. 
Howard from Great Britain. He imported new equipment and new technology. He had electricity there and uh, vapor for uh, the work of the machines. There were many places and cities in which this fabric had branches. After the revolution in 1918, it was nationalized. This factory is still active nowadays and produces paper production. The filigree of the factory whose owner was Mr. Olkin, a councillor for commerce. This is the Rostov district of Russia. That was the first time that uh, the uh, title of the Council of our Commerce was established and he was the first man to get it. The book has a lot of uh, unidentified filigrees, uh, different monograms, different propatrias, uh, the uh, royal lila, the chariots uh, and many others. Now let we speak about the restoration process. The book is uh, sewed by linen threads uh, and the sheets were of different degree of conservation. And we see that in different places uh, it is differently soiled and differently ruined. The ink, inks used are different. We decided not to disassemble the book because this is a historical monument. And if we lose the sewing technique, we can just well lose the history. But the sewing itself was rather good. We decided to restore it without disassembling. We measured pH, and it was around 6, which means that the, uh, no rinsing was needed. We at first took pictures, then mechanically cleaned uh, the papers by a rubber's a rubber crush and microfiber uh, maps mops uh, well the uh, the book was uh, very thin so we put cardboard under each page to avoid uh, well damage to the book we had local rinsing and we put cardboard and polyethylene films under each sheet and filter paper too. The rinsing by uh, what uh, cotton wool tampons, some stains were processed by alcohol locally. Then uh, we tried to rinse everything avoiding the text. Then we had to consolidate the parts to strengthen them. For this, we had some uh, well parts uh, restored from an, another taper, and we had liquid paper pulp, and then made or well just produced these pieces of paper under press. Then the produced sheets was dried and alcohol processed and then added to the weak parts of the book. We also used Japanese long fiber paper, used wheat uh, for the paper. The sheets was pressed were pressed under load and the cardboard first was placed under each sheet and different layers of the filtering paper and of course the load or the press was stronger in the places where restoration was more important. The pressing 
well was rather long in time because every humidified paper had to dry. The first sheet, which was the book cover, lived separately and because of that it was most seriously damaged and soiled. But it was uh, possible nevertheless to work separately with it. So first we mechanically cleaned it, then we uh, checked the stability of the ink, and for this we used indicator paper. We tried to check if there were free iron ions in ink. Then we cleaned the paper by uh, soap film and then rinsed. In some places there was Japanese paper used to strengthen the paper and from the head and bottom it was uh, sewed to the book stock. So this is the final view of the uh, book after restoration. Uh, well, mechanical stains were removed. You see the papers were straightened out, cleaned. And now the packing. A special case was meant uh, from cardboard of museum quality. After restoration we managed to preserve the author's sewing, the size of the sheets, and the original view of the book. So we managed to restore the book without uh, losing its individuality, identity, but at the same time it became stronger, more complete, and the cover sheet was returned in its place. So now it is possible to work with this monument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I think uh, there are no questions. If there are any later, then the people will approach you. And now I would like to invite our next speaker, Yekaterina Lotsmanova, and she is going to make a presentation about the analysis of different glues used for restoration. I would like to say, to say that uh, we did this work uh, not by chance, you know, it wasn't by accident that we started uh, doing this research. There are so many different uh, uh, materials and substances on the mar market, whereas the binding substances uh, is of prime importance. That's why it's very good when we have uh, good uh, substances for restoration that can be applied easily, that can be kept. Uh, but we sometimes don't understand what happens to the document, how it affects the document. And so our research was aimed uh, at uh, comparing different substances. So we compared classical adhesives and uh, um, other kinds of adhesives, both produced uh, here in Russia and uh, uh, abroad. <coughs> I'll try to speak uh, from memory because I can't uh, see much on the screen. So the objects of our research, we studied wheat starch. We considered it as a classical option different cellulose ethers. You can see different types of cellulose ethers that we studied, then a supernatant liquid. We 
we studied uh, how the treatment uh, affects uh, uh, the document. So we used a different uh, waste paper. We used the books published in 1915 that had whole leaves with some uh, ye yellow color, but it wasn't very strong yellow. We also used uh, restoration paper, nine grams per square meter. That's what its weight. So these were the things that we were working with. Now speaking about the methods of research. First of all, we used uh, thermal humid aging according to ISO standards under the temperature of 80 degrees and 65% humidity in the chamber. So we checked the optical indicators before the aging and after the aging. Also, we checked mechanical properties like fracture tension and breaking resistance. We also measured pH. Uh, and again, we compared samples before aging and after the aging. So what can we say about the optical properties? We basically uh, used these glues to strengthen uh, or to duplicate using the restoration paper. So now speaking about the optic indicators, after we strengthened uh, them, we could see that the yellowishness colors were reduced. So wheat starch was the, the most, uh, the strongest uh, adhesive. So when we compared these glues, we can say that wheat starch film was more opaque. MC400 glue did not uh, affect uh, this yellowishness as, as to other, they actually uh, didn't have much attack uh, um, effect because the yellowishness uh, uh, remained. Now, as a result of duplication, we saw that uh, the level of uh, yellow color was reduced, but I guess that uh, um, thin restoration paper that was used for duplication played its role. And we used uh, uh, Glucel G uh, MC400. Uh, Glucel E 12.11 units. So you can see all these numbers in the table. So there was a very slight difference between different kinds of adhesives. The first uh, four samples uh, affected the documents uh, um, quite um, effectively because they made the documents transparent. After uh, thermal humid aging, of course, the color became more intense. For example, when we didn't use any washing, when we didn't use any neutralizing, we uh, could see that the color uh, was changing during the aging process and it uh, had its own impact. The yellow color increased by several uh, units. Now, here we analyzed physical and mechanical properties. Speaking about breaking resistance, when we strengthened the documents with uh, uh, pasting, so when we used um, wheat starch, Basically, it helped to improve breaking resistance properties. So 
uh, glucosyl G gelatin uh, improved the res bre breaking resistance, but as to glucosyl E, it didn't really affect these properties. These results were quite unexpected. When we worked with humid and thermal aging, uh, glucosyl E and starch affected it positively. So we compared it uh, looking at the documents before aging and after the aging. Of course, wheat uh, starch is very popular, so all the people are using it. But anyway, I wanted to say that after the aging, we could see that uh, the, there was a quite uh, big reduction um, in this indicator. But if we speak about untreated documents, the strength was higher. So we have to take into account all these mechanical properties, taking in and consider the rigidity of a film, because these uh, we did not study these adhesives as films. We we probably we can only assume that cellulose and uh, uh, glucel G provides a more rigid film that helps to improve this property of breaking resistance. We uh, have been working with cellulose ethers for quite a long time. I guess we uh, were working with this 15 years ago. We had students and uh, we studied uh, the properties of the film that crumbled. So we studied meth methyl uh, cellulose and uh, we checked uh, its duplication qualities. The results weren't so good. Then our foreign colleagues mentioned that the results weren't so good. And, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, yellow. So cellulose ethers is a good material for restoration but you have to be very careful when you work with them so this was about uh, surface uh, pasting i have to get back I don't know why I can't control it. What should I do to find the right slide? Now this was uh, something that I have mentioned. Uh, this is about destruction properties. Sorry. So this was about uh, fracture resistance of the samples that were strengthened with duplicating. So when we use restoration paper, we have uh, we res we get a, a whole complex: the document, uh, uh, the paper, and uh, the adhesive. So basically, it shows that the resistance uh, uh, fracture resistance properties improve. So we can see like many fold uh, increase and they show the best uh, uh, fracture re resistance properties after the aging. So blue cell M shows the best uh, figures. And now the destruction properties when we for example stretch the document or try to break it here you can see the results that we received after we strengthened the documents with the gluing and uh, call it to loss shows the best result uh, its uh, resistance properties in improve by 50 percent so tile loss uh, glue cell G and glue cell M, glue cell E and the super uh, 
meat and by 40 percent then uh, wheat starch improves by 18 percent and if we take a look uh, at uh, the rate of aging after 12 days we show that all these uh, samples show very good results. Uh, the resistance is 99%. So wheat starch improves uh, the strength after the aging. So basically, uh, this uh, strength remains uh, as it was before aging. Now, when we used duplication for strengthening the documents, we realize that uh, uh, glue cell E, glue cell G adhesive properties were very low and when we s stretched uh, the documents we could see stratification yeah, you know this delamination uh, that happens uh, in a second as to the other samples you can see this sequence colitulose, tylose, glucel M, MC400, wheat starch, and supranatant liquid. And again, uh, the samples that, were, uh, that went uh, through the aging process retained their resist breaking resistance properties. So. The uh, uh, wheat starch and supernatant uh, liquid showed that uh, the resistance property increased after the 12 days. So it means that the natural substances play the major role here and they are on top of this list. Now, speaking about the chemical properties, the document that we used uh, as a model had low pH 4.6 and 4.2 after artificial aging. So, if you look at this table, you will see that when we put uh, adhesives, we didn't find uh, any drastic changes. So we analyzed extracts. We didn't use pH contact meter, we used a classical method. So if we took a different kind of paper, for example, cotton paper with neutral pH value, probably we would uh, have a different uh, result. But the document affects the result, and that's why the figures aren't good. But, uh, the, you know, adhesives are not designed to neutralize acidity level because uh, we should use different uh, methods if we want uh, to achieve, uh, to remove uh, uh, acidification. So we uh, used cotton uh, uh, swabs uh, soaked in distilled paper. We worked uh, on um, um, glass uh, substrate uh, and then the restoration paper would be removed easily 10 or 20 minutes later. Now speaking about the adhesives. So here you can see the example of tylose. We used microscopic research and we did it for different adhesives and we realized that quite many adhesives turned into gels colloid uh, solution, so it was very difficult to capture this, but tylose uh, uh, has uh, a gradual process of uh, swelling up, so you saw dry uh, uh, texture, and when we added a small drop of water, we did this research under the microscope, and that's what we see. We see how this particle be gets bigger and uh, 
get swollen. So this uh, happens after two minutes. Here you can see what happens after five minutes. And it uh, uh, gets bigger and we can see cellulose fibers that appear. Later, five minutes later, we used a bigger scale, we magnified it, and so we can see cellulose fiber with its characteristic features, which is common for deeper fibers. It means that they probably used linen for these fibers. Now let's look at starch, what it looks like. So this is wheat starch, the dry uh, starch, uh, but the um, magnitude scale is different. So 63 in the first case and 10 in the second one. And they are very special uh, starch particles. Uh, as, uh, if you look at the right picture, you will see that it turned into gel. So we can see these starch grains that uh, got swollen. And uh, of course, the picture can be different. It depends on the temperature of uh, adhesive production and the duration of the process. We wanted to open the starch grains, but we had to limit them to a certain degree to avoid uh, the molecular destruction because it would reduce the viscosity of the starch. So we have to be very uh, careful uh, when we used iodine, uh, you can see that it uh, uh, paints uh, these uh, uh, substances yellow, so glucel G as to uh, natrium game C. We see the similar picture. We can see cellulose fibers that uh, appear and they are painted blue. So they acquire this bluish color. This is only our assumption. If we use some natural fibers, you know, when we identify the structure, usually they uh, uh, are colored uh, yellow. But I, um, the mo modified fiber, when uh, cellulose ethers are produced, then they are colored yellow instead of terracotta colors, whereas our natri KMC is made based on cellulose. But this is just an assumption and we cannot prove it. And some conclusions that you see here. So, based on our research, we can say that we can recommend uh, wheat starch for duplication. We can also recomm uh, recommend some other natural substances uh, like tylose, uh, Clusel, M and MC400. MC and we can uh, recommend MC400, Clusel M and wheat starch for strengthening the documents uh, by uh, uh, gluing. So this is it. That's the results of our research. Thank you very much. And we'll continue. I would like to, re to remind you about the time limit uh, the maximum is 15 minutes, and so I now invite Mr. Shamil Shikhaliv. He is going to speak about the project Oriental Manuscripts of Dagestan. He is a researcher from the Department of East European Studies, Amsterdam University. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak about our project, Oriental Manuscripts of Dagestan, 
who's been who was on from uh, 2017 to 2020. <laughs> First, I would like to speak about the manuscript collections of Dagestan. They may be divided into two subgroups. The first is uh, state-owned collections uh, with uh, almost 7,000 manuscripts, but the main bulk of uh, Muslim are in private, private and uh, monk, um, um, monk collections, some 30, 35,000 of manuscripts. The uh, history uh, covers uh, almost 1,000 years from 1009 to the 1930s, and uh, almost all genres of the Muslim scientists are presented. The languages are Arabic, Persian, Turkish, in the Dagestan and Arabian graphics, and the geography of the origin is Dagestan, uh, the Volga and Ural region, Crimea, Iran, and the Middle East. One of the oldest manuscripts, uh, first uh, about the collection of the Oriental art, about the Institute of History, where the project was going on. The oldest is Palimpsest, uh, which is uh, written on vellum, and uh, this is a very old translation of the Gospel to Georgian. And uh, the Georgian language was erased, and uh, the Arabic text was overwritten in the 14th century. We had a specialist from Georgia who uh, said that uh, this palimpsest is a translation of the Bible, a uh, fragment of the Bible tra uh, translation into Georgian, and perhaps this is one of the oldest translations. So some other manuscripts. Uh, this is on paper, uh, one of the oldest ones which are stored in the manuscript collection. This is Quran. Well, of course, all manuscripts are, date, are dated Qurans. This is an astronomy manuscript. And as I said, in 2017, we started a very big uh, joint project together with the charity fund called Peri, who also linked uh, the Spanish and Emirate uh, companies to our project. Each company had its own uh, direction. Uh, the Spanish company uh, provided uh, us uh, with the equipment and uh, the Emirate company uh, equipped our restoration laboratory and training of the people. Our restorers uh, produce paper themselves. I'm going to dwell upon that. So these are the ingredients used for the production of paper. The ingredients are provided by the same company uh, from Emirates. And uh, this is a very short, uh, well, uh, visual uh, representation of uh, what was before restoration, the process, and the final result. Here you see the equipment for digitization. We have in parallel uh, the restoration of the manuscript and uh, their digitization. And we also created databases uh, in three languages, English, Arabic, and German. The main parameters are shown here. When we described the, the manuscript, uh, we had some problems. Some 80% of them uh, were not attributed. They don't have authors or titles. And so only judging by the fragments, uh, we have to identify them. And uh, plus, uh, many uh, manuscripts are not dated. So in the process uh, of uh, our work, when uh, the researchers uh, well, have in their hands some several thousand uh, manuscripts, then just comparing the dates, the place, uh, 
uh, they compare it with the characteristics of the paper and well they have this experience which allows them to date uh, the manuscript to plus minus 30 50 years but this is typical of the local tradition because we had our own history of paper our own history of the handwriting and so on. Of course, Eastern Caucasus, uh, uh, if we speak uh, about the Islamic uh, manuscripts on the Volga Ural region, of course, uh, uh, both regions have their own specific features which must be taken into account. So, in parallel, we created a database, uh, digitized, uh, and restored the manuscripts. The idea was to uh, to make all digitized uh, manuscripts accessible, but uh, the funding unfortunately ceased, and uh, up to now we have digitized more than 2,000 uh, manuscripts. Uh, uh, some 40 manuscripts uh, have already been cleaned and restored, and we have a database of more than 5,000 manuscripts. Uh, up to now, oh, we keep uh, all these digitized uh, documents on the server, and uh, there it is possible to find the necessary information and take uh, the manuscript. Uh, I will speak very, very briefly about the types of paper uh, that may be found in the Dagestan manuscripts in their history. The earliest ones were written on the Middle Eastern paper. I will show the difference. And the dated, they are dated uh, from 11th to 15th century. Then, starting the 16th century and the first half of the 18th century, they are replaced by the Dagestan uh, paper. At first, they exist in parallel, and then the Dagestan prevails. And uh, I must note that the first. Um, uh, notes about the paper in Dagestan goes back to the 11th century. There was uh, such uh, a man, uh, uh, Abu Qasim, who um, was uh, well a producer and seller of paper. And what we saw in the manuscripts themselves, uh, the oldest uh, Dagestan paper uh, copied in Dagestan on the local paper is uh, 1075. Then starting 1590 until uh, 1760, it was used with the European paper and then in the, uh, the, Russian, the Russian paper. And of course, from 1860, there was Russian paper with stamps. Here are the features of some types of paper which were found by us in the manuscripts. So this is the earliest oriental paper, very good, very good uh, paper, wasp-covered paper. This is uh, the Dagestan paper of a rather poor quality, of different thickness uh, than European paper, Russian paper, and uh, the Russian paper with the stamps. Then uh, we, we identify the origin of the paper. We use handwriting. So by handwriting, we can determine uh, well the uh, story, the, the time of the uh, manuscript. Here you see the Middle uh, East Nasr and this late Dagestan handwriting. Uh, when uh, this um, um, handwritten <coughs> tradition was de developed, uh, there was a special well trend developed, uh, which is uh, known in literature as Dagestan Nasr. Uh, the difference is that the cone was well sharpened in a special way and was turned 90 degrees, so uh, the uh, vertical ligatures were very thin and the horizontal ones were thick. You compare it with the uh, Middle East or Ural um, uh, handwriting samples, uh, the tradition was different. So perhaps uh, this instrument was sharpened in a different way. So in the second half of the 19th century, when Dagestan became part of uh, the Russian Empire, when uh, the document uh, circulation uh, started to exist or appeared, of course, the handwriting changed. And uh, as I said, 
the uh, bulk of these books are stored in private collections and uh, from uh, 1994 uh, we had another parallel project uh, on the uh, well fixing and restoring uh, well manuscripts from private collections so very briefly now about our latest project as a postgraduate uh, I just came across uh, of one uh, Dagestan, uh, well, uh, well, priest, uh, or about one of the manuscripts. This was a, a library that belonged to the Rafa Fendi scientist in the village of Shamgoda. The uh, destiny, the uh, life of this library was rather tragic. The, I talked to the ancestors of the scientist, and uh, I was told that he was arrested in the 1930, and uh, all manuscripts were, well, uh, taken away and then destroyed. But I tried, tried to find the traces of this collection, and, uh, well, it turned out that it was rather interesting. When the people came to arrest this uh, scientist, the uh, NKVD or KGB uh, people put everything on the cards and, uh, well, um, took away together with the scientist. He died in prison in 1931, but uh, as for the collection that was taken by the people from uh, KGB, nothing is known. But there were so many books that it was impossible to take away everything. But they didn't come for the second time, and so the relatives of the scientists, being afraid of uh, the repeated arrests, uh, moved all uh, these books uh, to the mosque and put them into the cellar and closed uh, in the cellar. So the mosque was um, very soon after closed and there was a club that was set up there. And so uh, uh, in 1976, uh, the imam uh, closed, uh, opened, opened the cellar. But unfortunately, most of the books were just in ashes. But uh, he took out whatever was possible just to show the people, uh, for them just to read at least something. So this is uh, how it looks, how this library looks uh, now. In uh, 2019, I visited this village, put all these manuscripts uh, well, on the floor, cleaned them and digitized. Of course, in private collections, uh, there are so many uh, uh, manuscripts like this, and it is impossible to uh, well restore all of them. But we are very happy when we are allowed by the owners, owners to digitize them. Uh, we see that um, these are manuscripts uh, from the. Um, they cover almost 1,000 years. Some are, are from the 14th century. This is uh, a very famous. Uh, a dictionary of the Arabic language. Uh, this is another autograph here from the 13th century. This is also a very important manuscript uh, which was written according to the instruction of the uh, Seljuk vizier who founded uh, the famous Nizami Medrese or mosque in Baghdad. Then Arabic poetry, this is dated too. And uh, well, briefly, uh, these are the main, uh, when we work with private collections, uh, we uh, focus on digitization because we come across uh, the situation when some private collections are just lost. And in the three regions of our republic, uh, maybe in 2002 and 2004 and 6, we studied these private collections. So some had 300 manuscripts. Uh, another one, the oldest uh, manuscript, was uh, rewritten in the uh, beginning of the uh, 13th century. So, but these uh, mosques uh, burned down and together with the books. And so the database and digitization of uh, the, these uh, private collections uh, allows us to preserve them at least in the electronic format. 
So when we work at uh, this collection together with the financial support uh, of the uh, printing house Prill, we, um, we managed to create this electronic catalog and uh, uh, we are planning to continue this work with respect to other private collections. As for our main project, uh, it ceased in 2019 because of lack of funds, but I hope to, to continue to go on with this work and uh, it will give us to complete this digitization work and I hope that all uh, our manuscripts with all their metadata will be accessible online. It was very interesting. So our next speaker is uh, Tatiana Shapkina, who is the head of uh, Restoration Department uh, at Tver Library, so she will share her experience. That's not mine. Of course, it's very important uh, for the library to have regional, regional uh, newspapers because uh, they uh, keep our history, unique uh, local uh, history information that is uh, not reflected anywhere else. So the special uh, value for the Tver region uh, are the uh, documents that were created during the uh, Second World War. This uh, started uh, uh, up to actually in the 40s, uh, so it was very important uh, to uh, capture this information related to different battles. Well, uh, the, um, it was a phenomenon that uh, periodicals were still produced uh, these years in our region. The pH indicators were very low. It was uh, uh, well, something like three and a half. The situation was aggravated by the fact that the Great Patriotic War as a historical period has always been very interesting for our readers. So these uh, uh, newspapers being in high demand were really well uh, damaged, had a lot uh, of uh, creases and losses. You see, you see uh, how uh, some of them looked. These are the uh, traces of restoration, so we tried to well mend them uh, as it was possible. These are the uh, features of conservation. This is not just uh, uh, selected at random three three newspapers. This was uh, how uh, what they looked like in mass. Uh, partially, we uh, solved the problem by participating in the federal target program uh, Culture of Russia which was focused on the conservation and restoration documents of uh, regional collections. So we selected uh, the uh, issues uh, of the most damaged newspapers and uh, uh, or the people of the Russian National Library helped us to neutralize and restore these documents. And the restored documents were encapsulated to protect them from damage when they are given uh, to people and when well, they are stored. So our greatest thanks to these experts. The uh, participation in the program, creation of the backup Russian uh, uh, collection allowed us to produce microfilms uh, from the Tverskaya Zhizn Tver Life newspaper. Uh, 
so the uh, newspapers of the wartime were within this collection. We produce makeup films, and for them we use the collections of our libraries and the collection of the Russian State Library, Tver Museum and Archives. So we also visited all these organizations and collected these newspapers in case of lacoons. Uh, our uh, set of Tver life was augmented by the copies of uh, hard and film media. Thus, on paper, we have only 60% of issues of the proletarian truth from 1941-1945. Uh, but the completeness of uh, the set of this new paper on discs is 95%. Uh, new digital set allowed us uh, to logically uh, move to the conservation of the originals on paper, but unfortunately we didn't have resources uh, to, uh, pr to deal with the conservation of so many large format documents in a very, very ruin ruined state. We uh, were also, it was also very impossible for us uh, to order these works uh, with a uh, well, large uh, restoration center. And uh, as for the funds uh, to, 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 to get uh, from uh, our government, regional government, was also impossible because our region is not the richest one. So we uh, well know uh, very well that there was uh, no funding for the conservation and restoration of library collections for uh, many years. So it was a great danger to lose this part of the collection. And uh, this question was uh, discussed uh, with, uh, by Tver Library Society. This is a public organization uniting libraries of all uh, of the Tver region and they deal with the socially meaningful projects and ideas in the field of culture. This is not our speciality, but this is our common problem. And so as a result of this cooperation, we had a cultural and educational project about the heroic deed of the Soviet soldier in the region of Tver. This is the title of the project, and it, uh, under the aegis of this project, we were looking for a whole year. We also got the support from the presidential grants as we were conserving the historical memory. This is the structure of the project. The main targets were to preserve the historical memory about the heroic deed of Soviet soldiers in the region of Tver during the Great Patriotic War. So this is the history of the Kalinian uh, Front. And we also had to uh, educate uh, the, young edu the young generation and uh, to get them acquainted with the originals uh, of newspapers that were produced uh, in Tver district in 1941-1945. tasks of the project were formulated uh, in the following way. These were the stages of our project, actually, is to restore and uh, preserve the uh, exploitation condition of the newspapers using modern conservation methods, to organize the exhibition and multimedia environment for lectures and tours, uh, meaning the organization of group tours for the target audience and the information to, uh, uh, provided to the population of the uh, Tver region about the uh, um, people of the project involved in the project and about it, its tasks. Uh, we were working in the very well strict limits of the grant project uh, and uh, we were limited in time by one year. So uh, of 1,572 1, large format sheets, we couldn't allocate more than three months for conservation. Of course, the composition of the papers was very different and so the methods to be used were different. Oh, well, uh, Actually, every newspaper had uh, or needed its own restoration program. 
so well uh, the, the the sheets were were fragile, but uh, very very valuable for us, and so we were helped uh, by the people uh, from the Russian State Library. They restored, they uh, deacidified the, the uh, paper, they conserved the, uh, uh, the paper, and well, were responsible for the whole conservation cycle. While well, all uh, these um, processes had to be. Uh, concluded had to be done in one place because transportation was uh, highly um, well the, well we couldn't move uh, we couldn't transport to any other place these newspapers because we're so fragile I just well uh, took them up from the table and uh, they could just fall apart in my hands so uh, the usage of the conservation equipment uh, uh, was uh, so important because it is uh, allowed because it allowed us to do everything in one place. To uh, well, uh, filmoplast was used for uh, the different well quizzes. And you've seen already one of the pictures. Uh, and uh, some newspapers needed very complicated manual restoration. We use the restoration paper, uh, whose uh, well uh, color and composition was similar to the original one. And as a result, the pH reached the desired level up to eight. So we not only acidified, it also had some reserve on a very well satisfactory level. Well, the final stage was a production of uh, containers or cases from acid-free cardboard. Uh, before that, uh, not it was not uh, every annual set. They had their own cases. The cases were used for several sets. After that, uh, on the premises of the library, we have organized or established uh, some well, places for uh, showcases with drawers that uh, protect the newspaper paper from light and look at them only when the people come and want to have a look at them. And so we, our work was supported uh, also by local ethnographers, uh, and the support was uh, really very significant. They were very loyal to us and supported us enthusiastically. Oh, we had tours, lectures, uh, live lessons about the events that uh, took place at the front at Kalinin Front during the war. So this is how these lectures and how these tours looked like. Uh, because of the coronavirus, of course, we had to limit uh, the people in the group and uh, to uh, well make an, most of the events online. I would like to speak about this uh, online event. Uh, a report from the yellowish pages. Oh, the thing is that the students and the school children find interesting articles that are of interest to them in the newspapers, and then they make films on their basis. This is how it looked. I especially pay attention, I draw your attention to this uh, well, action, because we managed not only to invite the target audience, but also to engage them. Uh, these people, these children, uh, teenagers and students were uh, at first our visitors, and then they became volunteers. The films and all other materials related to the project are on YouTube. Uh, Tveri stories and also in Vkontakte uh, Pro Tveri. Our action is long term thanks to online. The project is over, but the visitors still, in, the number of visitors still increase. And this is, uh, of course, very good. 
the work on the conservation of newspaper uh, newspapers, war newspapers, hasn't been fin finalized. The regional center of the presidential library, named after Yeltsin, uh, is still continuing digitizing the newspapers of the Tver region from 1941-1945. So we finished digitization of the local newspaper and now we started working with the regional newspapers. We cooperate with the staff members and editors of uh, our newspapers in the region uh, in order to uh, find and uh, digitize and restore the newspapers stored in other uh, libraries. Um, in open access, you may see the results uh, of the regional center of the presidential library. And uh, the regions uh, were so happy to see that, and at first they couldn't believe in the existence of this service. And it's uh, not necessary now to go to the uh, regional center to read these newspapers. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and let's continue with the program. I would like to invite uh, Nurlan Sherimbekov, who is the director of the library at the Un International University Alatua from Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic. Good morning. Dear colleagues, dear participants, it's a great pleasure for me to take part in this conference. So my presentation is about our conservation works and what we do at the Library of Un uh, International University, Alato. So our university is located in Bishkek, which is the capital of Kyrgyz Republic. We have four f faculties and 16 departments. I'm the director. I have been working as director for uh, over two years. I have taken part in uh, different international conferences organized uh, during these last two years. Our structure is presented here. We have only three people. We have automated system, so we have an electronic catalog. And the head of uh, the library, Dinara, I'm the director, and Ainur, who is uh, uh, working uh, with uh, readers, so she is responsible She's responsible for servicing department. Uh, we have to provide uh, access to our users. Our collection is not very big. We have uh, both open uh, uh, resources and closed resources. As you can see here, lots of figures. And I would like to show you what it looks like. We have just opened a library on the 30th of March. At the beginning of August, we opened the reader's room, but we changed the, uh, the location now. We extended uh, our spaces. It used to be a library here, now it's a reader's room. So we have changed uh, the design. As I said, we have an electronic catalog and it means uh, you can uh, get access, you can uh, order the book just by pressing the button at home. We use Jordan electronic program. We don't uh, have restoration department at our university library. But we have conservation units, so we work with conservation. Before our renovation started, you know, it wasn't uh, the best space for books. Uh, we had lots of dust. Uh, and here, now you see that it has changed. We made a very good environment, uh, air conditioning, 
uh, heat isolation system, so very good environment uh, for readers and we hope that we'll be able to protect our books and maintain them in a good condition. So this is uh, what it looks like. The books uh, are located uh, on two layers, so uh, we put our books, uh, repository, like book storage space on the second floor so that uh, the readers could basically use the books that uh, are on the first floor and our book repository is on the second floor. That's our space organization. As I said, we have an electronic catalog. Any student, any professor working at university can use it. They have login and password, so they can find the book that they need. You can see the list of books, and you can use your smartphone to book, to, uh, to order any book. And here you can see the statistics of um, our um, Readers, so what kind of students use our library, what kind of uh, resources they're using. On behalf of our library, there are many different events and activities. Uh, so we announce uh, about these events in our social media. And this uh, picture was taken eight days ago when we just uh, opened the space and it is named after Rosa Hanimetov, our professor. He died recently and so this is uh, why it is named after him and this was the photo during the opening. I would like to thank you for participating in this conference. It's my first time in Moscow. It's my great pleasure to take part in this conference. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk to you and answer your questions, both in Russian and in English. Thank you. It's very interesting. So now I would like to give the floor to our next speaker. And uh, the speaker will tell us about scientific restoration. This is uh, Ivan Ivanov, who is director of the binding workshop Garda. Uh, he will try to be very brief because people are hungry and thirsty. I'm going to speak about governmental and commercial uh, scientific restoration. Well, this is the contents of my paper, four parts. Uh, I will speak uh, about the first two only, and uh, the last ones are not very important. If we speak about restoration, scientific restoration, we speak about scientific methods. Uh, if we use uh, uh, commercial, uh, church, state, restoration. It's not exact. It's only one uh, scientific, but we can speak about different styles. How, on the basis of the uh, equipment, experience, uh, uh, and how these things determine, uh, determine uh, restoration. This is a quotation from Yuri Bobrov that the style is uh, the experience of the restorers and the material and technical basis. So the restoration may be state or commercial uh, as a style, but the restoration still remains scientific. The style is based on the material and technical basis, on the equipment, uh, on the equ education of the people, and uh, strictly speaking, these are limitations uh, uh, or shall we help the restore 
to uh, well work, or and then we can limit the uh, paper or determine what is needed. And if something is really vitally needed, we can uh, add these things and help that the restore. What are the targets? Of course, the targets are also different. Uh, commercial restoration is a type of restoration. Uh, focus or the, the further circulation of uh, the, f the, the further selling of the document. The government, the state will never think about selling it, but commercial restoration focuses on selling. It must go to the collection, it must go to the museums, it must be uh, studied further. And this is the principal difference uh, that determines uh, the the difference between the state and commercial restorations. This is a very simple uh, scheme, a simple drawing, because both the uh, state and the commercial restorers use one of the same methods, but in the commercial part, uh, we orient more on the construction uh, on the operative uh, short-time conservation and restoration, effective conservation, and uh, the state uh, well focuses on preventive uh, uh, cons uh, restoration and more on conservation. Uh, for the customers of the state restoration, these are libraries, museums, and archives, and for the private ones, there are dealers, uh, uh, buyers, uh, and for the 30 years of development, when the market started developing, we see other difference. State restoration is more technocratic one. What is it? We have a collection with funds, uh, books from different periods and on different topics. It may be 19th, 20th, 21st um, century. And uh, the cha chaotic principle is that we create uh, the environment for the conservation of all the collection, and not only according to its different parts, sections, and topics. The uh, environmental or ecological principle uh, runs that uh, all books uh, are united by one epoch or personality. But the commercial principle is when uh, only special books are collected. For example, the books from the collection of the Emperor Nicholas II. And so a restoration issue is based on this difference. And the restorer who works for this customer works only for or on the specific epoch. He specializes in this. And uh, the third approach is uh, uh, typical of the commercial market. Uh, this is uh, an album from the collection of uh, uh, Empress uh, Elizabeth and uh, the uh, renovation history of the binding is not the question of the restorers, because restorers first have to study, have to research, and uh, in this case it's just something uh, only stylish, made, uh, resembling the original document. As uh, for the uh, restoration of the technocratic style, one these people are very functional when they speak about their bindings. They have to strengthen their covers, they have to duplicate the original material using acid-free cardboard, and there may be some documentary functions added to it. Uh, it may exhibit some items. This is a technical minimalism. So, accordingly, this is an example of the technocratic style to the state restoration. This is one of the federal libraries, and we see a book with the almost lost binding, some boards are preserved, so we made a new cover, 
and duplicated uh, the uh, material on the new binding. This table, uh, well, it's just uh, written, but well, it shows that uh, technologically state restoration uh, bases uh, on conservation and restoration of the main block and uh, it processes some of the uh, collection materials. Commercial restoration tries uh, to produce something which is uh, exhibition uh, suitable and it uh, processes uh, all the materials, all the incoming materials in a definite uh, style. And commercial is very specialized. Uh, in the commercial sector, it's possible to deal only with the 18th century, leaving apart the 19th one, for example. Well, uh, the commercial scientific restoration, uh, the environmental style in the commercial restoration is an attempt to use restoration for the purpose of uh, preserving the art uh, value of the document. This is the so-called library approach, which is used in the state restoration. And it's used by uh, state restorers in commerce. They duplicate uh, the cover, but sometimes they do it more delicately. You see the library approach. The book is at the bottom. It was, uh, now it is duplicated. The spine was torn off, and it was duplicated by a, a leather of a similar uh, color. And then uh, everything was put into the original cover. <coughs> Again, you see uh, very well done restoration, but you see that the locks uh, uh, don't uh, very often match the uh, history. Uh, the so-called museum approach in commercial restoration means that everything is preserved, what is uh, inside the binding, and uh, in some complicated cases we have to invite uh, specialists on restoration in art or metal. Um, we uh, not always try to use this method because cleaning of the material, duplication of the material, strengthening of the material with stamping and gold stamping, all this is done within this museum restoration approach. Another example of this, uh, a very simple example of this museum approach, when the covers before restoration and after. The picture uh, of the restor restored item is uh, at the bottom. And uh, you see uh, that the uh, spine is removed. So, well, the covers uh, were just torn off. We uh, w restored the papers, put them in inside the original covers. But if you look at the uh, spine, you see there are, there are no connections, no edges. So the uh, duplicating and the original materials are very carefully connected. And uh, on the right, uh, we have three volumes when some of the original leather is missing. And uh, the stamping was done uh, well uh, in the type standard way. And we just put or well, restored, not restored, but duplicated the original stamping and put everything in place. Another example, the cover uh, misses one corner the leather is missing, so we just uh, add leather, tone, use the fillets, the same in thickness, and then tone the leather and uh, add gold, a sheet of 24 karat uh, during restoration. Another example, of some losses. It's just a technical uh, moment in the process when leather is added, uh, when it is uh, 
prepared in such a way so that the uh, uh, regional was uh, the regional leather was just butt to butt to the uh, new one and then we color and tone the leather. The antiquarian approach, well, very often it is um, well mixed uh, with this uh, well novelist novelist approach. It means that we have to restore the lost parts, and we have to restore them on the basis of what we have. We know the scripts and the status of the original bindings. It's not uh, always uh, possible in a multi-volume edition to uh, reconstruct to, for example, three volumes were lost and uh, we have only one left. So nothing to look at. So the restorer studies the sources, uh, understands what existed on the market and then well makes a copy of what was lost. The methods, the first the research work, measurements, uh, the uh, selection of materials, uh, then cleaning, uh, well, using gold and all everything, well, everything is absolutely standard. And uh, so uh, you see on the left we see a picture of two volumes. Uh, number two is original, uh, number one is new, and uh, on the right we see a photo showing that this is a novelty uh, book. And what is the idea? The idea is why uh, are we aging? Not to make something fake, but we want these books uh, to look, well, aesthetically beautiful if put together. So if a person buys these uh, volumes, uh, well, uh, aesthetically, uh, it is, uh, well, of course, reasonable to put these books together. And, uh, well, uh, this is the classical antiquarian approach. Some things are, well, original, but only volume number five was lost. This is another example of the antiquarian approach, uh, artificial aging. The upper volume is novelty, and it has the original uh, stampings and spine uh, and the covers, but the uh, spine is new uh, because uh, the uh, well, customer or the user wants uh, to have all the books that uh, look naturally in uh, in the library. And uh, on the right, this is a new binding. Uh, it uh, may happen when uh, the book comes without any binding at all. And uh, this is uh, something that is done according to the style of the already known bindings of the same books. We just reproduce the typographic style of the books uh, of that type. The stylistic approach. Uh, this is a very well questionable, very discussable thing, but uh, well, the restore makes a new binding in the style of the book of that time. It's not just a complete fantasy, but it is within the research. Uh, the author of the binding doesn't make uh, not an exact copy, but the one that looks very similar to uh, the binding that uh, could be used when uh, it was existing. Well, of course, here we don't have to imitate aging. We just will declare that this is a new thing. But we have to find the modern materials that imitate old ones. Two books, both are new. Well, it's not uh, important uh, well, what the time was, but actually this is the second part of the 18th century. This, they are styled to one, uh, one is to one style, the other to another style, but uh, we uh, stress that they, these books are new. Uh, also another multi-volume edition, new, and uh, 
after the study of what existed on the market in those uh, past times. There is a big difference uh, between the state and commercial restoration as to the uh, well um, statements of what is price and what is value. Oh, well, the people who don't sell things uh, see the value uh, in the uh, historical value of the thing. But uh, for the commercial restoration, the price is very important. And so what is valuable for the country is not valuable for the commercial one, and vice versa. The Brogos and their front collection and the ideal condition, uh, or maybe needs just slight restoration, uh, may be very quickly uh, made uh, by in commercial restoration, might they just stay on the shelves for many years uh, for state restoration, because uh, importance is paid to the objects uh, to be restored. Uh, organization of labor and the number of staff members in the state and commercial scientific restoration uh, in commercial uh, restoration, in, uh, this is uh, the system of the salary and bonuses, and uh, usually they work according to the principle uh, when they work on the basis of a certain monument, there is uh, well a group made to work on this monument, and after that they will just fall apart. Uh, usually it is done by many workshops. As for the number of people involved, uh, this is a very difficult question, but from uh, open data, we see that uh, there are 32 certified binding restores in uh, uh, f those restored by the Ministry of Culture. There are 576 people, 60 are in Moscow, one in Moscow Oblast, in Moscow region, six in St. Petersburg, one in uh, Leningrad uh, district, uh, some work in the regions, but uh, mainly even the central uh, regions and the biggest uh, cities, they don't have a lot of people, as you see. Uh, at that, uh, the, uh, there are more uh, binding restorers, uh, but they were not certified by the Ministry of Culture, so we can't be sure about their number. As for commercial market, so we don't have the number of people involved because uh, there are state restorers there who just uh, well uh, add or work additionally there. Uh, there were there are people there who use the antiquarian approach, who have their own uh, workshops, and uh, the problem of the commercial restoration sector is that uh, there is uh, no documentation, and all the work is done in uh, the well, shade. Uh, this is the table <laughs> about the restores. So yes, well, uh, that's about all. So really, that's a disputable question. This is just a viewpoint of an expert, and you may discuss uh, it, yes, just face to face. And uh, now we have uh, still another paper. Oh, well, would you like to have a discussion right now? Right now? Yes. This is the stumbling because this is the stumbling block, which is interesting for both parties, uh, because we have uh, here a lot of commercial restores, and this is just the first time that at the workshop uh, we have a report about commercial restoration and uh, their view of the state restoration. So I think that a lot of people present have very interesting questions. Can we just uh, dedicate some time to the discussion? So please uh, introduce yourself and ask questions. The head of restoration department, the Russian archive of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So we work with manuscripts restoration. I'm very sorry, but I think you, you mixed up two principally essential concepts, craft and restoration as science. If we speak about uh, governmental organizations, they implement scientific restoration. When they uh, basically do scientific research and they try to uh, conserve, to 
keep the original, whereas the, there are craftsmen, yes, they uh, know how to do it, but it's just a craft, it has nothing to do with science. If a good craftsman creates just a copy, uh, there's no science in that process. So we have to distinguish between two different things, scientific restoration and commercial restoration. Yes, uh, commercial restoration can be good, can be of high quality, but it has nothing to do with science. It's just a craft. Can I answer? Well, craft belongs to the third type of uh, works. For example, if uh, the restorer working at the library is doing a work in a library for eight years, yes, they are considered to be uh, like a state or public restorers. If I come to him, if I contact him and ask to do some work for me, he will do it for me. But it'll be a private uh, order. So the state restoration, commercial restoration have different purposes. So based on different purposes, we can have completely different results. For example, if uh, the restorer is working at the uh, library, so he is responsible for conservation and restoration. But once he starts working on the commercial market, and uh, he uh, perhaps restored uh, some piece of w some piece, some work that then uh, later gets onto the commercial market, and uh, uh, basically the purposes can. The thing is that uh, the purposes are different and what happens to books uh, can be different. If we take the manuscripts dated back to the 15th, 16th, 17th century, they exist on the commercial market, they uh, are being restored, uh, so for, uh, there could be different options, right? The library can suggest using acid-free uh, books for packaging and then the commercial uh, specialist could say, you know, we can uh, create a window for your manuscript, uh, to, but it's not about restoration. You are speaking about the environment, about what happens around the surroundings. But let's uh, stick to the uh, main question. Craft, uh, craftsmen um, do restoration, but uh, it's far from science. Let's uh, uh, take uh, the binding. For example, there's no embossing on the spine, and uh, we know that this is a typical uh, uh, spine with a typical stamp. So the state restoration will uh, probably leave it as it is, a commercial restorer. Uh, and again, it could be the same person, you know, the person that works at the library can have workshops uh, and they might uh, do it in their studio, so they can uh, uh, basically do some research, scan the original and then reproduce it, so there will be a small difference. Another example, if we speak about uh, binding, restoration, uh, they usually duplicate uh, the spine using the leather and then put into the original board, so the state restoration uh, does it uh, so that it would be noticeable. Now, as to commercial restoration, they would use special tools and basically they will use some toning, uh, keeping the original leather, so uh, they will uh, use some infills. Uh, so there are, there'll be some differences, you know, if we speak about the final uh, uh, appear, uh, final look of the book. You are focusing on details, but I want to stick to the main question. Commercial restoration has nothing to do with science. Even the examples that you have given, uh, when scientific um, restoration leaves the basis of uh, binding visible uh, so that people could understand this uh, uh, this is an old thing this is a new thing whereas commercial restoration will remove all the boundaries they will reduce it down to nothing and uh, eventually 50 years later the person won't know uh, 
uh, what happened? How come the, there is leather that was produced in the 21st century, whereas the rest of binding belongs to the 18th century? This is a principally important question. That's a critical uh, um, uh, border. Sorry that I'm so emotional. Well, you uh, were speaking about the monuments of the 15th and 16th centuries. They are the objects of cultural heritage. So if uh, this object of cultural heritage is restored uh, by the state, um, studio, um, they first uh, carry out the scientific research, then they have a council where they uh, make a decision as to how it should be restored, and uh, there are, there'll be several meetings, and uh, then the process of restoration will begin. The final result of restoration should be accepted by either council or the uh, scientific council. Whereas when you describe commercial restoration as a, uh, just uh, you know as a voluntary um, process, basically it's up to the person who decides what to do, what kind of embossing he can do. So you replaced the concept. I can uh, answer. Restoration Council exists uh, uh, actually in uh, commercial companies because they can win tender and uh, they uh, work with binding and paper restoration. So they have uh, a Restoration Council at those companies. Then uh, they uh, uh, Base, uh, write documentation for commercial orders as well. So it's not that somebody makes uh, the decision and somebody doesn't do it and it's just a whim. But you know, if we speak about restoration councils, all the meetings uh, are recorded, uh, they have mi uh, minutes. They keep minutes of their um, meetings, so if you want to take a look at this, uh, you can do it. Do you have such practices? Do you have similar practices? Can you show us the minutes of the meetings of those restoration councils? You, you will probably be the only organization like that, because uh, you haven't convinced me. I don't say that uh, commercial restoration is better. I just showed you what uh, we have on the market. So the uh, are different examples, and maybe there aren't as many examples of commercial restoration, but they don't show it very often because sometimes it's a private work and uh, they follow all the requirements. Uh, if it goes to the library, you will never be able to see it. Maybe 200 years later, uh, when the government decides to nationalize it, it will be part of the inventory. So, one of the problems that the commercial market has uh, uh, it, it's just because it doesn't show high quality professional work and they are paid for that uh, but in fact they using the same methodologies they work with laboratories they carry out research but you will never be able to see this but it happens not because it doesn't exist because this was the requirement of the customer the customer wanted to keep it secret I wanted to, to show you what I know you know you can't find it on the internet I just know these people that do it and that's why I decided decided to show it to you. Well, I guess this uh, discussion can uh, last for a long time. And uh, you can um, ask uh, as many questions as you want uh, during the coffee break. So you can come up uh, to the speaker and discuss it. Uh, of course, uh, there is a state restoration. You know, some people say there's a museum kind of restoration. Uh, but anyway, we have to move on. We have one more speaker, uh, otherwise we'll never get, uh, uh, we'll never get to the coffee break. Well, anyway, I just want to say that um, Ivan uh, mentioned the key phrase, it's up to the customer. So 
of course, if we speak about scientific restoration, there is no such uh, uh, notion as the customer. We know what to do and we know how to do it. Anyway, I would like to, uh, to uh, let uh, you invite the next speaker. Yes, we have another subject related to education. So it's about restoration education. Where can we learn the skill? How can we get the diploma? And Tatiana Shapkina, who is the head of the regional center of conservation at Chelyabinsk Regional Library. Hello. I would like to thank all the organizers for this uh, great opportunity to take part in this seminar. So I'm going to speak about restoration education in the Urals. I think it's uh, extremely important. Uh, I guess uh, it uh, might uh, be tiring. Uh, I was writing my paper in 2018. In fact, we managed to resolve uh, several issues and I hope that later on uh, the situation uh, will uh, improve. Uh, but anyway, our regional library basically is uh, in the same condition. I was supposed to present this paper last year so that's why I wrote it earlier. And so the situation hasn't really changed since then. What should I do? So here is the building of our regional scientific library. Uh, you know, many people know about uh, restoration uh, as uh, the activity related to protection, uh, conservation and uh, uh, restoration of different cultural objects. But it's very often that the professional restorer uh, has this veil of secrecy because uh, restorers have unique uh, skills and um, have a very narrow specialization. Very often we hear the questions, how can you learn it? Where did you get training? We have only four librarians at uh, the uh, Regional Conservation Center. So they uh, also perform the functions of uh, restorers. They have a lot of work to do, uh, but they don't have any special education. It's not uh, possible to get uh, the right uh, training because we don't have uh, any institutions uh, that would train restorers so that they could start working in the archives uh, and uh, conservation centers. So, so uh, however, recently it has become an acute uh, problem because we f are facing with certification. So um, we uh, have uh, to uh, our specials have to have uh, special education uh, confirmed by certificates and diplomas. So this um, certification is the key issue. You saw some uh, photos of our center. So usually uh, artists, historians, uh, librarians uh, become restorers. So uh, they come to the profession uh, uh, by different uh, ways and uh, they uh, usually don't have uh, uh, mentors, uh, they uh, don't have a chance for continuous uh, qualification upgrade, so they don't have systematic knowledge and uh, uh, it's very different uh, from uh, restoration uh, faculty students uh, because uh, they already know a lot and they can start restoration works after they graduate from the universities. So sometimes uh, people face with uh, challenges like lack of money to uh, pay for education uh, and um, 
usually uh, large uh, cities don't have restoration centers or highly qualified specialists. Uh, there could be only one uh, specialist in binding and it means that there is no chance to hand over knowledge and experience to younger people. So. Uh, it means that uh, some unique documents uh, are kept in the wrong way, they are not being restored uh, or conserved. So it means that our specialists lack experience, they don't have a chance to exchange experience with other specialists, uh, lack of personnel. Uh, lack of uh, the documents uh, uh, and uh, books uh, and resources to improve uh, their knowledge and education. The very rare conferences and uh, seminars uh, doesn't really produce good uh, results. So, uh, in fact, uh, we could resolve this issue if uh, we could uh, have a chair for uh, restoration at the Chilamic State um, Culture Institute or Chilamic State University or Art College. But we uh, don't have the Faculty of Applied Art uh, at uh, the State University. Uh, so, there are quite uh, many issues. There were many debates uh, uh, related whether we should uh, set up uh, a department for restoration at university or at the Institute of Culture in Chelyabinsk. If uh, we could open the special department for restoration. It should also be available in Siberia, not just in the Urals, because Siberian region also has a similar problem. Another thing is related to highly qualified teaching staff. We don't have many highly qualified professors that had practical skills. We understand that it depends on practical experience, because if you want to become highly qualified specialist, you need a lot of practical experience, not just theoretical knowledge. So the lack of funding, the lack of equipment makes it really uh, difficult issue. So there's also informational vacuum because uh, I can feel that uh, there is not enough uh, information about that. Uh, one of our specialists uh, went uh, to the conference held by Tomsk State University in 2018 and uh, it was about practical restoration. Uh, so the uh, most of specials didn't have special restoration education, so they said uh, they organized an international school of restoration that uh, was designed to uh, you know close the gaps in our specialist knowledge. So they shared uh, the experience, but it was not uh, systematic. You know, it's very important that the schools did it systematically, so the systemic uh, uh, character of knowledge and experience is of crucial importance, uh, otherwise we won't be able to resolve this issue. Uh, but uh, so far we haven't really managed uh, to create a special department for restoration. So uh, we uh, have to have a highly qualified specialists who could train students uh, and if we don't have it, uh, we wouldn't be able to do restoration works properly uh, and it means that uh, we won't be able to provide access to the best monuments uh, because they are uh, deteriorating uh, very fast. So we have to resolve this issue.
as quick as possible. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Yeah, you raised a big problem. So if uh, there are, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to talk during the coffee break. I suggest that uh, we start a coffee break right now. We can have it for 20 minutes and. Uh, uh, in 20 minutes we will continue our sessions and uh, in 20 minutes we will start a practical uh, uh, session. It will be hosted by Zaira Ibrahimova and she will talk about uh, self-made paper in Dagestan. So let's have a coffee break. <laughs> 